Uh, Ms. Wynne Smith, in your written testimony, uh, you stated by increasing China's profile on international standards bodies, it aims to implement the nation's China Standards 2035 blueprint and built and road initiative uh, for the next generation technology. Uh, what can Congress do, uh, particularly the House Science Committee, uh, to ensure the U.S. maintains our leadership in the international standards bodies? Thank you, Congressman. Well, standards have for many years been a non-tariff barrier. Even our colleagues in the EU have used standards as a way to protect a different technology or innovation path from the U.S. in adopting standards. We have, as you know, a private sector standards-driven process with various committees. Um, NIST, our National Institute for Standards and Technology, plays a role. But at the end of the day, it's the private sector committees that develop our standards. They do not have, quite frankly, the reach, the resources to participate in many of these critical standards bodies. So it's very important for us, in my opinion, to beef up the capacity of NIST and our private sector bodies to participate fully at scale, because sometimes we only send one or two people to a standards body. And you look at the international organizations. I mean, China now is, is, is poised, and they may be, the head of the, inter, uh, the IPO, the Intellectual Property Organization. Yeah. So we need to invest and hmm. populate these international groups, because the U.S. alone cannot do that. And then also it goes back to what I said about technology statecraft. We need to work with our allies and partners, UK, Australia, Japan, India increasingly, and the EU on these standards that are so critical in the technologies that determine national security. Because all of these are dual use technologies, quite frankly. Yeah, they like to play everybody's game by their rules. Uh, Mr. Drogmeyer, uh, in your written testimony, you uh, had recommendations regarding the national uh, S&T strategy and quadrennial S&T review. One recommendation uh, is the need for a skilled technical workforce. You know, I represent the Kennedy Space Center, and, and, this, and I've heard from uh, companies that the need for these highly skilled uh, technicians is, is really great. Uh, what policy changes do you believe are needed uh, to uh, help us maintain a pipeline of this kind of personnel? Well, thank you so much for asking that question, because it, it oftentimes uh, goes unnoticed that, that the skilled technical workforce is really the underpinning of a lot of the science and technology development that we do. You look at large facilities like um, uh, the Large Hadron Collider. You look at the LIGO facility that had the, uh, you know, the first gravitational wave. Uh, sorry, there, there are people, technicians, who develop you know, capabilities to, uh, to, to have very incredible vacuums and things like that to keep these facilities going. They're skilled machinists that use uh, 3D printing and other kinds of things. So they're very, very important. I think what we, we need to do, we heard an example from Dr. Bedell that, that Lawrence Livermore, in their own initiative, they reach out to two-year and technical schools to incentivize the folks to do this. And I think we need to make sure not only are we resourcing them, but we're making clear the value that they have, that this is not just sort of a second-class citizen job. If you don't have a PhD, well, it doesn't really matter. No, these folks, in many respects, are the, the underpinnings of our S&T enterprise. So we need to have programs. The National Science Foundation has one in particular uh, for the uh, skilled technical workforce, it's, a, I forget exactly the name, it's something like something, career tech education or whatever. But, but those investments are very, very important uh, across all, all disciplines to incentivize these folks coming in and showing the value that, that, that they, uh, they actually have. Uh, Ms. Wynn Smith, would you repeat uh, your uh, statistic uh, that you mentioned earlier about graphite? 90% of the world's sourcing of graphite comes from China. Thank you very much.